afternoon everyone. I'm Priya Bhargam. This is Nathan Chen. We are from group number 18. And today we are going to talk about supercapacitor ethereds. So first I would like to go over motivation and inspiration behind our project, followed by the design concentrations, and then I'll go over the prototype design. Then Nathan will take over and talk about results, discussion, and conclusion. And in the end, we'll talk about the f any future work that is recommended. So as the motivation, um, our uh, focus was on e-textile industries. As we are all aware, uh, with development of electronic devices, uh, we have started integrating them into even clothing materials, which has given birth to e-textile industries, which basically combines electronic and textile industries. Currently, the global market has been estimated from uh, using one of the study has estimated it to be five billion U.S. dollars by the year 2022. This uh, market for e-textiles is very broad, and it can be divided based on the end users or the um, by d depending on the end application as well as the region. North America is um, one of the biggest. Um, North America has one of the biggest market for e-textile industry. So. So to uh, power these electronic devices, we need energy storage devices. Conventional uh, energy storage devices such as batteries, they uh, are dependent on uh, chemical reactions to store energy, and therefore uh, they have uh, smaller uh, life cycles since they degrade over time. Supercapacitors um, have the advantage that they store energy in the electric double layer, which is basically the layer um, the, uh, which is the layer, if you see in the diagram, uh, the ions, um, the positive and negative ions, uh, that, that the negative ions from electrolyte depositing onto the electrode surface, they form the electric double layer. So essentially, supercapacitor consists of two electrodes and um, the electrolyte uh, as well, as well as electrolyte. And so upon charging the supercapacitors, the ions of the electrolyte uh, get absorbed onto the electrode surface. And these uh, adsorbed ions, just like the uh, parallel plates of a capacitor, they form electric field, and they, uh, that is how supercapacitors store energy. Supercapacitors also uh, have the uh, so, so for the main uh, performance of uh, to have an effective performance of supercapacitor, there are two primary factors: the high surface area, as well as uh, of the electrodes, and also the ionic mobility of electrolyte. So supercapacitor has advantage over batteries, such as it has high power densities, it uh, uh, has fast charging discharging cycles, and it can also withstand many cycle lives. Uh, but the, there are certain, uh, there are current issues uh, with advancement of e-textiles. Uh, there is a requirement for energy storage device that are compact and that can store a lot of energy, uh, but can also be integrated into textiles. And uh, supercapacitors currently available in the market are two-dimensional, three-dimensional, they are bulky, and so there is a requirement to have a one-dimensional supercapacitor so that it is easy to integrate in into our clothing materials. Also, the current fabrication techniques for supercapacitors are very much complicated. The so goal of our project was to uh, come up with a simplified method of producing supercapacitors which, uh, while also maintaining their performance. So now I would like to go over the design considerations, starting with the customer requirements. So for our supercapacitor fiber, we required a flexible fiber so that it is easy to integrate it into the fabric, but also we required to have mechanical, uh, strong mechanical properties so that it is also uh, resistant towards wear and tear uh, in the conditions like washing. Also, in terms of the, uh, uh, the performance, electrochemical performance of the, our device, we need energy density to be high enough so that it can power biosensors and also the appropriate power density is required so that they can uh, meet, meet the power rating of the device, but also uh, to prevent their uh, degradation of the electrolyte uh, through electrolysis. In terms of functional specification, our supercapacitor needs to have high capacitance and conductivity, again to power our uh, small devices like biosensors, but they also need uh, good enough ionic diffusivity so that the charging and discharging can be fast enough. The flex loss uh, should be minimum, which basically means that our supercapacitor needs to retain its performance uh, under, uh, under the conditions like bending of the fiber, and also the cycle life needs to be long enough so that it doesn't just degrade uh, quickly and it lasts longer. So now I would like to go over our design. We propose to have, we, pro uh, we started with our design uh, shown here on your right. So this design essentially consists of two electrodes, which are nylon thread coated with graphene as our active material. 
these two electrodes are then immersed in a gel electrolyte uh, since we are, uh, we, uh, are looking for a solid state, uh, solid state supercapacitors. And then we propose to use silicon tubing as the casing for our uh, supercapacitor device. So nylon was used as the uh, base of our um, device because it has high mechanical strength, it's cheap, it's abundant, flexible, and also according to one of our reference paper, uh, it, it has good adherence to graphene oxide, which was used as our uh, coating material. And next, we use graphene as the active material of our electrode of the supercapacitor because it has high conductivity and high surface area. However, graphene cannot be directly coated onto nylon because it has low hydrophilic nature uh, compared to graphene oxide, which is more hydrophilic. So we, start, we uh, prepared graphene oxide, dip-coated uh, dip nylon with it, and then we reduced it to obtain our graphene. For graphene oxide, we used modified Hummer's method, uh, where we used five mesh graphite flakes and uh, oxidized them using the falling ratio of sulfuric and phosphoric acid. And then we freeze dried it to obtain graphene oxide pow uh, powder. This graphene oxide disp uh, was then used to form a dispersion and ethanol base. We used ethanol because it has low surface tension, so it saved a lot of uh, drying time. And also, um, the affinity of graphene oxide was more towards um, nylon compared to ethanol. So this also made sure that our coating technique was uh, proper. Next for dip coating, we manually immersed the nylon threads for five minutes in the geodispersion based on our reference paper. And then we dried it in the oven at uh, around 70 degrees. For the reduction, we first thought about using thermal reduction, which is very commonly used. However, the temperature uh, that we could reach was only uh, limited to 200 degrees due to the melting point of nylon. So we knew that thermal reduction would not give us efficient results. So we switched to uh, chemical reduction using hydrazine. For chemical reduction, we tried three different conditions. So basically, we used 50 volume percent of hydrazine solution, dipped our nylon, uh, geo-coated nylon threads in it for reduction. We tried room temperature overnight, then we heated the hydrazine at 70 degrees for one hour on recommendation of our supervisor. And then we uh, also tried to uh, increase the time period by heating it overnight. Uh, while working on our electrode, we also uh, worked on our electrolyte side by side. For our electrolyte, we use polyvinyl alcohol and lithium chloride solution. So to, uh, uh, to come up with our recipe, we did a lot of optimization studies by using three different molecular weights of polyvinyl alcohol. Then we also use, sorry, different concentrations. Uh, for our lithium chloride, we use 20 gram per milliliter solution depend, uh, based on our reference paper. And for the mixture, we heated it at 90 degrees. Uh, for four hours at constant, uh, while constantly stirring till a clear solution was obtained. For our casing, we proposed initially to use silicon tubing. However, for ease and convenience of testing, we used initially a cardboard container and then we also came up with a 3D plastic container um, to test our device. Now Nathan will go over results and discussions. Right, so I'm going to talk a bit about what happened with our results during our project. Um, so after, seeing our, uh, after reducing our first wires, we did some preliminary tests for conductivity on the four-point probe to see if our coating and reduction had worked. Unfortunately, the currents that we measured were un unstable at both 1 and 10 volts uh, across uh, triplicate samples. The fluctuations were around the 1 nanoamp range, so clearly our initial attempts had flaws. Uh, we hypothesized that the issues with the conductivity might have to do with uh, the coating being discontinuous. Uh, this could be due to our physical handling of the threads or our coating procedure not working well. Um, to confirm this, we decided to image our coating threads under SEM. Uh, here are the SEM images taken of our uncoated nylon here on the left and then the geocoded nylon here on the right. Um, as you can see, the coating was spotty and not very uniform, so we un now understood why our threads weren't conductive. Uh, we deliberated on why our coating method had failed and also consulted with our advisor. Uh, in the end, we suspected that the problem had to do with our graphene uh, oxide material uh, being faulty. Uh, this is for a few reasons. Uh, first, we know that graphene oxide is hydrophilic, uh, whereas reduced graphene oxide is hydrophobic. Um, nylon threads are also hydrophilic, so the geo should adhere to our threads properly, uh, but if this was reduced graphene oxide, then it wouldn't. Um, so in order to confirm this, we decided to use um, another geo sample from another research group and compare the two samples that we had under Raman spectroscopy. 
Um, so to analyze the geo samples, we drop casted them as films onto PET substrates, and then we looked at the Raman spectra, paying attention to the ratios between the G band here at 1600 and the D band, which ideally shows up at 1350. Uh, Raman analyzes the birational modes of atoms in samples. In our case, the G band corresponds to the sp2 birational in plane of the carbon atoms, while the D band uh, corresponds to the defects in the carbon lattice, which are introduced during the geosynthesis process as oxidative functional groups. Um, therefore, for graphene oxide, we expect a low G to D band intensity ratio since there should be many oxidative defects in the carbon lattice. Um, as you can see, our old, uh, our old geo sample had a ratio of 1.14, which indicates that it's already been partially reduced, uh, whereas the other geo sample that we obtained from the other research group um, had an IGID of 0.57. Uh, this confirmed our hypothesis that the problem with our coding was due to the old geo being reduced already, and so it wasn't sticking very well. Uh, with this new information, we decided to compare codings between the two geo samples, again under SEM. So here are the images of SEM for our nylon threads coded with our old geo on the right and the new geo on the left. Um, you can see that the new geo produced a much more uniform and continuous coding, although there's still some uh, fraying from mechanical stress that we put onto the threads while handling them. Uh, given these results, uh, we thought that we would get better connectivity, so then we returned to uh, the four-point probe. Um, so we measured about 100 nanoamps at a one volt bias on the four point probe uh, with still some slightly uh, unstable readings at around the 10 nanoamp range. Um, so we decided to go to a potentiostat to try and measure the IV characteristics. Um, and we obtained 163 nanoamps at one volt bias. Um, this is around two orders of magnitude lower uh, than we need for our device, which was 20 microamps. Uh, so we still needed to improve it. However, this. Uh, connectivity was good enough uh, that we decided that we wanted to try a capacitance test. Uh, so during capacitance testing, um, we performed cyclic voltammetry. Um, however, we didn't observe any um, capacitive behavior. It was just resistive. Um, so clearly, there was still something wrong with our uh, project. Uh, we decided to uh, try and look at the reduction method since we knew that the connectivity was now working. So it either had to do with our electrolyte or our uh, thread coating and reduction. Um, in order to do this, we looked at the Raman spectra of the post-reduction uh, threads. Uh, we, you can, uh, the reason why these graphs are a little bit more noisy is because we had to analyze uh, the RGO uh, samples directly onto the nylon thread instead of on a PET substrate. And the nylon peaks convolute with the 1350D band. Um, we tried to do our best to baseline correct and normalize and subtract that away, but it did result in some noise. Um, you can see from both reduction methods that we used, the thermal and the hydrazine, that um, they each uh, reduce the thread to around the same uh, extent. Uh, however, this is not uh, the kind of reduction we were expecting. From literature, we were expecting a reduction ratio of around uh, 1.3 to 1.5. Um, so now we had a reason for why our uh, threads were not giving us enough capacitance, even though they were slightly conductive. Um, so we deliberated for a while and then we tried a new reduction method where we increased the temperatures up to 70 degrees as Priya has uh, shown you and uh, we did it overnight instead of for only one hour. Um, we did more testing on the four point probe to try and get better connectivity. Uh, we did notice on the four point probe at this point that when we tested different sections of our thread we would get different conductivities that could range by up to plus or minus 100%. Um, this is probably due to uh, the, uniform, the uniformity of the coating not being good from us handling the threads so much. Uh, we had to basically clamp the threads uh, and this handling probably scratched away some of the coating. Uh, previous conduct, so from this information we can see that uh, the conductivity is about on the same order of magnitude, uh, but it is more stable. Um, from this, we can say that the previous conductivity measurements that we had got, which were poor, were probably a combination of film discontinuity and our RGO lattice defects that were not properly reduced away. Um, unfortunately, this was near the end of our project, so we didn't have time to do the Raman uh, spectroscopy for the post uh, geo reduction. Um, in order to make sure that the electrolyte was not also contributing to our problems, we decided to use. Um, some electrical resistance and EIS measurements to uh, characterize it. Uh, the measurements were taken using a digital multimeter and you can see the resistivity values here. 
Uh, when we reversed the polarity of the DC bias, uh, we found that the resistivity dropped to 600 ohm centimeters, which uh, is what we expect uh, because of the ion migration that should happen. Uh, so this confirms that uh, the electrolyte was working at least from an electrical resistance standpoint. Uh, to further characterize this, we used AIS uh, constructing the Nyquist impedance and Warburg plots um, for the measurements that we took. Uh, the frequency range that we used was 5 megahertz to 100 hertz. And we obtained the ion diffusion coefficient uh, using the Warburg equation uh, from the slope of the Warburg plot there, which gave us the Warburg coefficient. Uh, this, sorry, that should be a minus. Uh, the ion diffusion coefficient is around the order of magnitude that we expect, which is 10 to the minus 10. So this confirms that our electrolyte was indeed not uh, malfunctioning our device, and it had to do with the reduction of the cathode coating. Um, so what did we learn from all of this? Uh, so there are some minor lessons that we learned. Uh, sample handling is one big issue that we ran into that we did not expect. Uh, we need to find a way to minimize the amount of handling that we do with the threads. Um, the four-point probe that, that we found with conductivity testing is okay as a quick test, but we need to use the potentia set in order to gain more accurate readings. And uh, when performing Raman, uh, we found that we should avoid using uh, nylon substrates because they convolute with the geo bands. Um, aside from those problems, the key challenges that we faced in this project were that uh, the geo product tends to vary a lot uh, depending on the synthesis method. It seems to be extremely sensitive to the parameters that you put into it, uh, whereas other synthesis methods might be more robust for, more robust for other materials. Uh, geo also we suspect may degrade over time by taking on water, uh, so we need to find proper ways to store it. Um, the thread coating was also a problem in trying to obtain a uniform and continuous uh, coating. And uh, the excessive handling that we did didn't help this either. Uh, geo reduction was also a problem for us uh, because the thermal reduction was poor due to the limitation of nylon's uh, melting point, And hydrazine seems to require much more time and temperature in order to work properly. Um, so the major findings that we can extract from the experiments that we did were that the ideal graphite, graphite flake size that we should use for our geo uh, synthesis method is a 10 mesh. Uh, and the acid ratio for the graphite oxidation should be 9 to 1 sulfuric to phosphoric by volume. Uh, for the geo reduction method, we found that thermal reduction was ineffective at temperatures that we are limited to even across uh, multiple days. And that hydrazine, uh, although uh, somewhat good uh, requires elevated temperatures and longer reaction times, at least 70 degrees overnight, if not more. Um, for the electrolyte synthesis, we actually found that our electrolyte performed well, and that using the recipe listed there, uh, we should get a good gel that has good resistivity and good ion diffusivity. So in future work, uh, we suggest that for the electrode materials, we, want, we would want to test the actual effect of flake size on geo quality in a more controlled setting. Uh, we would also consider putting a metal film uh, deposition first on the threads in order to increase the conductivity and to also help uh, adhere the geo onto the uh, thread. Uh, this would increase the complexity and the cost of the device, but uh, if this is necessary to obtain proper capacitance, then it can't be avoided. Um, we also recommend using sufficient acid to fully oxidize the graphite, as that was one of the major problems that we ran into. Uh, for the electrolyte, we would like to explore other electrolytes in order to break out of the water window uh, uh, potential range. Um, so we could use things like ionic liquids, although they are more expensive and have the problems of their own. Uh, and we would also like to optimize our current uh, gel electrolyte, which is the PBA LICL. We didn't get to test as much as we would have liked to. Um, for the reduction method, we would like to optimize the hydrogen print. Because you guys are already over time by okay. two minutes. Sorry. Um, we would like to test other reduction methods, and then we would like to revisit the casing afterwards. So thank you for listening, and we can take any questions now.